Good morning, gentlemen. Excited to be able to be here with you this morning, and I'm excited. They kind of assign different topics and tracks for the teachers during uh, the conference, and I got this track that's all about Jesus. You know, let me tell you what, he's, I love talking about him. Anyways, this morning we get to hit on accepting Jesus, and really guys, this is the most important thing in life, it really is the only thing that matters in this life. So I love the Word of God. We're going to spend some time in the scriptures, flying through uh, a few passages. The first one's going to be in Revelation chapter 20. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, we're going to look at um, uh, the end of the book, because it really is a conclusion to what it means to accept Jesus and why that is so important. So let's take a read here, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. It says, And then I saw a great white throne... In him who sat on it, and from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, and by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his work. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So guys, this is talking about what is known as the great white throne judgment, okay? You guys all know that we are all going to have to stand before our maker. Every man, woman, and child that's ever lived or will live will stand before their creator one day. Now, I want to just throw out real quick, there's a difference between what we're talking about here with the white throne judgment and what is known as the Bema seat. How many of you guys have heard of that before? Okay, a few of you guys. The Bema seat um, is an evaluation for believers, okay, of their stewardship, what they did with Jesus and what God has called us to do in life for those who believe in Christ. Now, this is a different judgment that um, we speak of here. It's the great white throne judgment. And there's also another judgment of the nations. And some people get that confused. That's in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 36. So this judgment only involves the lost, okay? It follows the second resurrection, okay? It's a resurrection of condemnation. Um, and there were, uh, where they're judged for their works, okay? Not to get into heaven, but to really judge and determine their punishment. And it's going to be meted out by God and not Satan. A lot of people think Satan does this in hell. No, okay? The reality is, hell is really the wrath of God. And you guys know that we all stand guilty before God. Okay, I know I do. I'm a sinner. But we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. So this judgment really is based on the books that we read about. I mean, it's objective. Every man has done whatever we've done in this life is recorded. All the secrets, okay, everything in our mind, every thought, they are known. Now, there's a permanent record. Okay, Job chapter 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were written, and oh, that we were, they were inscribed in a book. And also, guys, in verse 7, we read here of the book of life. Okay, this is talking about Jesus, okay? And then, in the book of life, those that belong to the Lamb of God, to Jesus, who have accepted Jesus, they are written in the book of life. Chapter 21, verse 27 speaks to this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end of study. But if we take a look at verse 13 here, the sea, death, and Hades, okay? It doesn't matter when or where a person died, okay? The Bible is very clearly against any teaching of reincarnation. That's not a thing. We don't get another chance. You guys understand, one chance, one life. And what we do in this life, and again, I said accepting Jesus, that's the most important question, the most important thing in our lives, what we do with him. So the Bible is clearly against that or annihilation. Some people think, hey, we just cease to exist after we die. Do you guys know the Bible tells us that eternity is written in our hearts? I talk to atheists who don't believe in God or afterlife and having real conversations with them, 
yeah, I know there's something after this. Even though they deny God, <laughs> heaven and hell, God's put that in their hearts. They even know there's something after this life. That's why a funeral is so sobering for us, isn't it? It's like, whoa, you know, mortality. What's after this life? We know it's there. So when we speak of Hades, guys, that's Old Testament. And the word that is used in Hebrew is Sheol. The New Testament uses Hades, a holding cell of souls awaiting judgment. It is a place of conscience punishment, but not eternal destination of souls. So when translated hell, okay, that is Gehenna in the Bible. You guys know that it refers to it as the lake of fire. You guys know that Jesus spoke about hell a lot as we read the Gospels in the Bible. He speaks of hell way more than he ever spoke of heaven. Why? Because he loves us and he's warning us. If you guys had a loved one that you knew were about to go and do something that would end their life, it was terminal, and you had a way out, would you warn them? Would you say, hey, be careful, don't go that way? And that's exactly why Jesus spoke so much about hell. Now, the reality of this hell fire, Gehenna, separated from God's presence, but never from his wrath. Okay? So hell really is a witness to the righteous character of God. He must judge sin. Okay? How many of us want God to be just? Right? And I have people all the time, well, if God is so loving, so good, why would he send anyone to hell ever? And then I ask that person, well, wouldn't you want God to be just, to be fair? Wouldn't you want somebody, if they did something really bad to you or to one of your family members, if they had to go to court and have their day in court and stand before that judge, wouldn't you want that judge to give a fair, you know, punishment to that person? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. Why wouldn't we want that of God? Okay? So... Hell is a witness really against, uh, or a witness to man's responsibility. And hell is also, guys, a witness to the awfulness of sin. Some of us think, oh, sin's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal. Okay? Sin leads to death, period. Sin separates us from God. And we've been created to have relationship, fellowship with God to bring glory to Him. So if we once saw sin as God sees it, guys, we would really understand why a place like hell exists. Does anybody in here know why hell was originally created? It was created for who? Satan and the angels. It was never intended for man, but we rebelled. <laughs> We're the ones that sinned against God, okay? So, um, God will not lower his standards or alter his requirements. Because of sin, we incur guilt. So guilt is a liability, it's a debt that is to be punished. So sin brings about guilt, causality, fault, which results in punishment. There has to be a sentence and ultimately condemnation. So the Christian will not be condemned because Jesus bore the guilt okay, and the sin and took our punishment upon himself on the cross. So those who have accepted Jesus are exempt because Jesus was judged in their place. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21, Christ became, Jesus became sin for us. He literally took our place. And he took our punishment. We all deserve death. And he died in our place. Okay? So Jesus was judged in their place, was taken, really taken their hell. Now, we consider sinners who reject Jesus will face him. Okay? Um, what's that one? There it is. I want to look at John 5.22 with you guys. Okay? For those who reject Jesus, they're going to have to stand before him one day. That's what Revelation here is talking about. For the Father tells us in John 5, judges no one, but has committed all judgment into the, or <clears throat> to the Son. So sinners who reject Jesus will hear him say, I never knew you. And I think those are the scariest words that anyone will ever hear. I want to take a look with you guys at 
the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21. This is Jesus speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Okay, there's a lot of people who say, hey, Jesus is my Lord. I know he's the Lord. But he says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, and that's what we're reading about in Revelation. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Have we not done all these wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this really ought, us, <laughs> ought to move us guys to be praying to accept Jesus if we haven't. And for us who have, that we're praying for the lost. That they would come and bow the knee before Christ and accept him as their Savior, as their Lord. So, there is justice for those who demand it, guys. Okay? And that justice for those who won't accept the mercy of God. Because really when it comes all down to this life, okay? For the last how old I am, I had to think for a minute, but I was born in 1977. My gravestone someday will say Landon Churchill. Born August 21st, 1977. Little bitty Dash dies. Hopefully it's this year. I'm ready to go home and see Jesus. <laughs> you know, that little bitty Dash. All these years, the only thing that matters is what did I do with Jesus? Did I reject him or did I receive him? That's the only thing that matters in this life, guys. So, but for those who accept Jesus and his mercy, their name's going to be written in the book of life. And this is key, guys. Okay? Take a look here in Revelation chapter 21, verses 6 to 7. And this is the key to accepting Jesus. It says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So when the best of this world's pleasures leave us thirsting for true satisfaction, for that inner peace, okay, this book beckons us to come and take of the water of life without cost. We see that in the next chapter, chapter 22, verse 17. So one prerequisite here is to be thirsty. You actually thirst for God. Okay? On earth, nothing satisfies. Okay? Not wealth, fame, pleasure, possessions. Okay? I've talked to some really rich dudes in this life. You know what? They're empty. They want more. They don't have peace. Okay? Um, so the only thing that really can quench our souls, because God's created us this way, we've been created for him, relationship with him, to know him, he's the only one that can satisfy you guys understand that? It's him. So that's why Jesus, it is Jesus we accept. It's not a ticket to heaven, okay, so we don't have to go to hell. A lot of people, hey, I'll come to church. I'll believe the gospel if that gets me my ticket to heaven one day. Jesus is it, guys. That's why it's accepting him that is so important. Jesus is the prize, and he's the treasure that our hearts truly long for so what must we do to be saved okay to accept jesus well i'm glad you guys asked the scriptures are very clear i want to share with you in second or sorry ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 okay that we're saved through grace or by grace through faith it says for by grace you have been saved through faith not of yourselves it is a gift of god not of works least anyone should boast so do you guys understand what the Bible is teaching us? Okay, We're not saved on our own efforts. I did this, or I'm a good person. I am saved through faith by grace. It is a gift of God. We can't earn our salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. And if we could earn it, then there was no reason that Jesus came to die for us. He would have died in vain if there was another way. But there was no other way. That's why he came and he did it. Now, I want to encourage you guys, if any of you are putting stock in, you know, I'm a good person. <laughs> I go to church. I'm this denomination. Or I got baptized. I did this. 
You're going to stand before God and say what? <laughs> you have no standing. Again, it's not what we've done because we can't do enough. Okay, We've all fallen. We need Jesus. And that's the point. It's a gift. But also with a gift, a gift has to be received, right? And according to the Bible, this gift is received by faith. And that's why it's so important, guys, that we take in the word of God. You guys can jot down Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we're saved by faith, okay, we got to take the word of God seriously. And I encourage people all the time, okay, get into the word of God. Read for yourself. I got a gal that I've known for 12 years now. She serves at a pantry that I serve at. I love her dearly. But she is so hardcore Catholic. And we talk gospel all the time. And she keeps telling me, I'm going because of all the good stuff I'm doing. She's in her 80s, working her butt off. And her whole mentality is, I'm a good person. And in our conversation, she's better than them. And them. And I do this and that. And I keep, she believes in Jesus. <laughs> but it's different than believing. You guys know the Bible tells us that even demons believe. Okay? I'm not trying to bash Catholics at all. The point is, if we're taught anything that is not truth, not biblical, if you're being taught that you can be saved by good works, that is a lie from the pit of hell. There's a lot of people I've talked to, okay? I'm good. I'm a good person. <laughs> I don't need Jesus. Oh, that's a scary place because I'm doing it myself. No, he came because we couldn't do it. And that's why we need to humble ourselves. Because without humility, there is no accepting Jesus. Pride keeps us away from our God, our maker. And the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if we're saved by grace through faith, do you think we need to be humble in accepting Jesus? Absolutely. And that's the heart God hears. That's the person that gets saved. It's the one who finally bows to me and says, Lord, I need help. I need forgiveness. I need you. Another scripture you can jot down is 1 Timothy 3.15. Know the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the stuff I'm saying here, guys, don't take my word for it. You go back to the word of God. What does God say? Okay. In this room, I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know where you're coming from. Okay, It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what has God said. Okay, Because he's right. He's the only one that's right. So the scriptures will make us wise on salvation. Even in this study, a lot of times when we hear about accepting Jesus, let's talk about the good news, the gospel. Okay, Why are we talking about judgment and sin? I don't know about you guys, but that's the way God has communicated it to us in his word. You guys know how often judgment and sin is spoken about? A lot. So whether you're saved or not, okay, we need to live in the reality that we're all fallen. We've all come short. And I don't know about you guys, there can't be good news without bad news, correct? And I think that's why God is honest with us. I think that's why God loves us enough to warn us and tell us the truth. But we need to be humble and real before him. So, last scripture I want to look at is in Romans chapter 10. It says that if we confess, okay, this is the key passage in scripture to being saved, to accepting Jesus. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So both one's heart and mouth are involved in accepting Jesus. It's conceived in the heart. Do you guys see that? Heart's always means it's like that center of our moral being. It includes our intellect, guys, our feelings, our will, our heart. That's what God's after, okay? It's our heart, our complete, who wants us. So saving faith really dominates entire being, mind, feelings, and will as a consequence. And this faith will really express itself in confession. Okay, for a person who comes to Christ, I love people who just accept Jesus, like brand new in the faith. What are they doing? 
they're sharing with everyone else they know. <laughs> you know, how can you not? And she's like, hey, I believe in my heart, and because it's in my heart, my mouth's going to speak. Man, I don't know anything. I'm brand new in the Lord, but I know Jesus loves me. <laughs> I know I'm forgiven. I know him. That's a part of accepting. That will be our next session, if any of you guys stick around. We're going to talk about abiding with Christ, doing life with him. But that's what happens when you accept him into your life. Okay, He is now in you, and you are now in him. And then we're also told in this passage, it's confirmed with the mouth. Okay, So this is one of the most helpful portions of scripture, of pointing the way to salvation, heart and mouth, the beautiful harmony of two voices here. So nothing, notice nothing else is added in the recipe of salvation. Nothing, not baptism, not serving, not tithing, nothing, guys, except believing on Jesus in your heart, confessing him with your mouth. So this belief is not merely verbal assent, but it's staking one's entire being upon this truth. You're all in. I want to conclude with a, <clears throat> quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon. Listen carefully. We believe everything which the Lord Jesus has taught, but we must go a step further and trust him. It is not even enough to believe in him as the son of God and the anointed of the Lord, but we must believe on him. The faith that is uh, is not believing certain truths, nor even believing that Jesus is Savior, but it is resting on him, depending on him, lying with all your weight on Christ as the foundation of your hope. Believe that he can save you. Believe that he will save you. At any rate, let, leave the whole matter of your salvation with him, in unquestioning confidence. Depend upon him without fear as to or to your present in eternal salvation. This is faith which saves your soul. And I agree with Spurgeon. All in. I can testify. I know Jesus. John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that you know God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. Okay? You'd be the best person in the world, but if you don't know Jesus, hell is awaiting you. But if you do know Christ, if you've accepted him into your life, you have eternal life. You've been forgiven of your sins. You're in relationship with your maker. You have peace with God, which I think is the coolest thing. Okay, I know I know God. <laughs> but we can't know each other's hearts. We can't. It's between you and God. And I want to encourage you guys, when it comes to sharing our faith or accepting Jesus, count the cost. Be real. I've seen so many people flippantly accept Jesus over the years, and they've totally walked away from the faith to the point that they don't even believe in God today. I'd have to ask, did you ever know him? Okay? If you really know him, you can't deny him. It's about relationship with God. So, in our last minutes here... Well, we don't have time for that. I want to make sure to have a couple minutes for questions, okay? Uh, are there any questions that you guys have? Yes, sir. Just a comment. Um, you know, with accepting Christ as your personal Savior and that, you know, that is fundamental, like you were mentioning, and uh, to reach out to people. But in the end, we win no matter if people are against us or for us. I mean, you know, we win being in his... Yeah. There's a final victory. I read that this morning in 1 Corinthians 15 and 16. Check those chapters out. It's a done deal. You know, sin has no power. The law has no power. It is Jesus, which is awesome. So is there any questions about accepting Jesus? I'm kind of bummed. Like, hey, I was assigned this, and this is like the most important thing in life. I could talk for hours on this. But I really felt led to lay out, you know, the, the white throne judgment. Because we're all going to stand there. And I know a lot of you guys probably do know Jesus already. But do we actually live in the reality that our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, everyone we ever have met is going to stand before God one day? You know, we're on a mission. We get to go tell the world. We're called to make disciples. Go teach them. 
okay, all that he has said. And that's why it's so important to get into the word of God. So I encourage you guys, if you're reading your Bibles, if you're sharing with somebody, give them a Bible. We can't make people seek, okay? Like we said before, the key is thirsty themselves. But if someone is thirsty, isn't it so cool if they had a Bible on hand to start actually reading the Word of God for themselves? So, any other questions? What about, like, repentance? Um, how that goes hand in hand with putting your faith in Jesus? Yeah. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on that as far as... Repentance starts with humility, you know, because accepting Jesus, if you turn to Him as your Lord there is a repentance. You have to turn from your sin. Okay? You turn from our sin to Jesus. Okay? And that's really, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next session, you know, of abiding. But that is key. Okay? Because when it comes to the gospel, guys, it is very clear. You know, there's the call to repent from sin, and there's that call, as we read earlier, you got to believe that Jesus really did die and rose from the dead. Okay? There's a reason why Jesus isn't on that cross any longer. There is victory there. He overcame sin, hell, and death. You know, so it is one of those things. I want to encourage you guys, be all in. Okay? Too many wishy-washy Christians out there, especially as men of God. You know, God calls us to be all in. In this conference, I love the name No Regrets. Doesn't that just kind of ring true in our hearts? Like, I know I don't want to live, like, <laughs> I don't know how many years I have left, but I don't want to live my old age with regrets. Okay? I know truth. I have the gospel. So, um, I got these books here up here if anybody wants a copy. Okay? I've read it twice in the last four months. Okay? Uh, it's gentle and lowly. It's one of those things um, that we're told to come to Jesus okay, and to learn from him. This has been one of the better books I've read in recent years. Um, if you'd like a copy, please grab one. It really gets into the heart of knowing Jesus, so they're free, uh, you can grab one. Cool? Cool. Well, Father, thanks for this time with these men. Uh, we're most grateful for all that you have done. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your willingness to humble yourself, uh, to come and live the life we couldn't live. Uh, we thank you for the gift of salvation. You've made it available to all that will turn to you, repent of their sin, to put their faith completely in you. God, I do pray if there's any man here that hasn't done that, or that they would really count the cost, that they would weigh in these things and really seek you diligently, that they would willingly bow the knee and confess you as Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen? Amen. 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 Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Landon. Yep. You guys got 13 minutes to get to your next class.